Galloway, whenever you're ready. This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Mr. Tom Vanderhorst on Thursday, March 26th at 1500 hours. We're located in the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we talk about your experiences in Vietnam, I'd like to get a little biographic information about you. How old were you when you went to Vietnam? I was 23. Old man. Old man, yes. <laughs> uh, what was your family status? Um, let's see. I was the, I'm the oldest of uh, four kids at the time. My younger brother, who's five years younger than me, we went into the Navy at the same month. So it made Mama not such a happy status at that point. That was very difficult, obviously. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, my father and his three brothers uh, all went into the Navy at pretty much the same time. So uh, but, uh, I'm from St. Mary's, Ohio, small town. So small town farm boy. What, what year did you, uh, well, you went through the uh, Naval Academy, right? No, sir. I went, uh, I was, went through Officer's Candidate School. OCS, okay. Right. What was your sense of the Vietnam War before you decided to enter the military? Um, I, was, uh, I was a student at the Ohio State University, and, uh, of course, the, um, the war was going on, and it was a long way away. I didn't even really think much of it. You read the news if you had time, but it wasn't a big deal. And uh, you could keep up with parts of it. It was of interest, but nothing real personal until it got close to graduation. At graduation, uh, I was, I was um, there before the lottery. So when I graduated, I was going to be in the military. So at that point, I looked at it, and I was started becoming more interested in it. Uh, decided I was going to um, go into the Navy, and um, because it was my family heritage. Now, were you in uh, NROTC or anything like that in college? No. No. No, no program. So you were going to enlist? No, I was going, uh, since I was uh, finishing uh, uh, graduating, I would uh, go into the Officer's Candidates uh, program, which was up at Newport, Rhode Island, and it mm -hmm. was a uh, they used to call it instant ensign course. It was uh, four months. You go from uh, your college, you start out, and they teach you everything in four months, and all at once, I are an officer. And, uh, <laughs> and that was it. Now, uh, you went to Vietnam as a pilot, right? Yes, sir. So tell me about your flight training. Okay. After uh, Officer's Candidate School, I... Uh, went down to Pensacola, Florida, and started, um, I remember it was a rainy day, but it was warm down there, and uh, drove into Pensacola, and for a year and a half was in uh, flight Navy flight training with uh, Marines, uh, Coast Guard, and also some um, uh, South Vietnamese Air Force. Uh, they were training on A-1s. Uh, but anyway, went through the year and a half program um, did, with, including the carrier landings uh, on two different airplanes, things like that. We trained in Pensacola, uh, Whiting Field outside in Milton, Florida, then out in Corpus Christi, Texas. When, when were you assigned to Vietnam? I got my orders to Vietnam in uh, Let's see, I think I had uh, six. I knew before I got my wings, uh, which is a year and a half program. And I knew before my wings what kind of airplane I'm going to be in and where, what squadron I was going to be in. I was going to be in a P-2 Neptune, a P-2V-7 Neptune, which is a, um, it's an old airplane. It was even old back then. We had, uh, it had two recips and two jets, wing tip tanks and a plexiglass nose and uh, not pressurized, no air conditioning. So it was, it was pretty basic. We carried a crew of uh, seven to 10. We did patrol. You did, uh, you were patrolling for submarines or what? Yeah, we did, we did uh, a lot of, the main, um, I guess the main, um, what would you call it? 
The main, main uh, thing that the patrol squadrons are supposed to do is generally is submarines. But uh, we had a, different, uh, a little different situation on that. But as I was finishing up, once I finished and got my wings, they sent me to navigation school. Because at that time, we carried four pilots, and the fourth pilot was also the navigator. So I learned a lot of navigation also. So I, my first tour went over as a, a pilot slash navigator. And you were flying patrols off an yeah. uh, aircraft carrier? Uh, no, we were all land-based ah. because it was, um, it was quite big. And um, uh, we would, uh, generally we did two kinds of uh, missions. We did, one was market time. We would go between, uh, it's like a eight, nine, ten hour flight. We would uh, have a prescribed course that they would like us to fly, the intelligence folks would like us to fly. And we would do a, uh, like a random search pattern uh, that uh, we would go over, hit certain areas, and we would look for, of course, submarines, which we couldn't see from, the, um, from where we were at altitude. But what we did, we went after ships to see what kind of ships were passing through the area, which way they were going, what we'd take, uh, we'd go low level down to 50 feet and get pictures of the air, of the um, cargo, of the ships, yeah, see what kind of cargo they had on deck. Uh, did they have people on deck with uh, uniforms on, or you know, what did they have? So we would get that, get their course, speed, um, and what would happen, and we did that through the whole flight. And then they would, the intelligence folks would take and put that together and see which one of these people were going into Haiphong Harbor and are coming out of there. So we know who's resupplying and where they're going or where they're coming from. So were, were you also looking for uh, boat smuggling arms into the south or? Yes, definitely so. Ships going around to Sihanoukville to yeah. offload that way? Yes, in fact, we did. We got a call one time, and I was uh, our crew was on the um, ready alert, and we got a call. They had they had found someone had reported down at the very southern tip of um, South Vietnam, an unbelievably huge ship, of with a Chinese flag, and it was offloading men and equipment. They'd never, the, I forget what the length of it was. In but, South Vietnam. In South Vietnam, offloading. <laughs> and they'd never seen one that size. So it was, and our mission was to take our, we were bullpup qualified, and we would, um, I would be flying, and the co-pilot would be uh, taking care of the joystick, and our mission was to just eliminate the ship. Oh, and you had some arms on that thing. Yeah, yes, we did. <laughs> uh, and and the, on the way out there looking for it, and we never found it. There was obviously nothing there. We would have been able to see it. Uh, but it was, uh, we thought of the ramifications. If, what if there is something there? What if we do blow it out of the water? What, what do we cause? You know, or what <laughs> were we involved in? So it, it was not there. Yeah. But then we also did another, um, another uh, mission. I can't remember what it was, what the name of it was, the tactical name of it. But we would uh, take off from uh, Cameron Bay. That's, I spent most of our time in Vietnam in Cameron. In Cameron, and that was your at, at land base. Right, that's where our land base was. And um, what we would do is uh, prior to sunset, we would uh, take off to the east and go 60 miles, then parallel the coast um, all the way up to the DMZ and get there just about sunset, and it was almost dark. It was, it, was, it was officially sunset, but you could still see some things. We would then, uh, we had a, um, not a prescribed course, but a, uh, the, the fellows up above us, um, the AWACS airplanes were um, uh, controlling everything. They would They'd tell vector us, you. Uh, they, yeah. yeah, they would give us vectors, tell us where to go, and what we were, they were doing is they would, first thing we would go down uh, to 200 feet, and we flew at night with darkened ship, um, which means we turned all of our lights off and uh, put, put uh, curtains over the windows so nobody can see us. They could obviously hear us coming, but we, with, uh, we never flew our jets unless we have an emergency and take off and landing because it was a heavy airplane. Um, and so we you were flying on props? Yeah, we'd fly on the two props. And we used the, the, the airplane had in the, um, I guess you'd say, in, as the airplane was built, it was a simple airplane, 
two wings, two recip jets, and then they started putting electronic gear on it, got heavier and heavier. Well, let's, let's get some JADO bottles, jet-assisted takeoff bottles, <laughs> put on the back of it, and they would take off. And once it got in the air, they would just drop off the JADO bottles. And uh, it got, they kept adding more equipment, so we, uh, they needed bigger JADO bottles, so they just put two jet engines on there permanently. <laughs> and then we put tip tanks on it so it could carry all the fuel we were going to be buying. All so, the fuel you needed. Yeah. But we used them only for takeoff and landing. Yeah. So, or an emergency. So, but we would go down to 200 feet. This was the most, this is where you had to be a young man and, and uh, pretty much invincible. Yeah, and good we, kidneys. Uh, yeah, right. We would, we would fly at 200 feet down to 50 feet. And uh, we would be looking. We would be rigging ships. Occasionally we would uh, look for a submarine because we had a good radar for submarines for, for the, to be able to see the snorkel. And we also were looking for high-speed junks. And the high-speed junks, um, they had captured one, our squadron had captured one the, the year prior. But the high-speed junks had uh, two, my two Mercury 300 engines in them, uh, this little junk which barely moves. And what they were, they were, um, they were bombers. They were, um, you know, they're, they would make high-speed runs on their attempt, and they tried several times, high-speed runs on one of our carriers and blow, this out, blow the uh, ship up. And that was their thing. So we would look for those also. Uh, we also used to, uh, they used to use us for um, finding where the uh, fire control radar was for, um, for the SAMs. Mm. And as they were building, they would, what they would typically do is they would give us a vector toward the land, go straight toward the land at 50 feet. And uh, again, it was dark. We couldn't see anything. Fortunately, we had a good radio altimeter, which would keep us at that elevation. And we didn't have to work that hard on it. Uh, but we were awful close. But, uh, and then we'd get within like five miles, we'd have, they'd have us pop up. And as we were approaching three miles, we'd make a hard right turn or a hard left turn. And as soon as we popped up, they started lighting us up with the radar. Light you up with the radar. Yeah. And then we, we made a turn, and uh, they would uh, uh, keep following us. And we would just be taking vectors on where it is so we could uh, triangulate, find where the, where the fire control radar was. Send them in. Yep. Blow them out of the water. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, where did you come in to Vietnam on your first arrival? The first arrival, I flew um, initially into Clark Air Base in the Philippines, and from there joined the squadron, because part of the squadron was in the Philippines and part was in uh, Cameron Bay, Vietnam. And uh, I was there for two days, and our crew was going heading over, and so I went um, Joined the joined the crew, met the guys, and uh, two days flew in that, on your aircraft. Right. Yeah. Yes. So flew in our aircraft, and that was on a market time, so ten hours over there, even though it's not that far. Uh, what were your first impressions on landing in Vietnam? Wow. Something I'd seen pictures of, uh, the old Marston uh, runway, you know, the perforated, perforated. <laughs> PSP. <laughs> <laughs> PSP. That's right. And um, it's like, wow, I'd never seen that for real. And uh, <laughs> a lot of the walkways were made out of that. You know, there's a lot of sand, um, a lot of um, sandbag bunkers, and uh, different hooches and, and different. The um, all the buildings were the same color. Of course, we were on the navy uh, navy side. There's a they've got navy, army, air force, and and marines. They've got, they're all situated there in different locales. So. Um, unusual. I, I met a whole bunch of new people I'd be living with for two or three years from then on. So, uh, uh, sounds, I heard things like, things were very, became very familiar. You could tell a, a Huey gunship from a Phantom any old day. And it was like, beautiful sounds. Still beautiful. can. Still can. <laughs> yes. If they're behind me and a long way away, I can still, I know what it is. Raise the hair on the back of your neck, yes, sir. or it does on mine. Completely. Uh, what were your initial duties? Uh, initial duties, I was a, um, uh, besides the navigator pilot, 
uh, on, on my crew and we'd go out every, about every uh, second or third day. And uh, cause we were gone for um, eight to 12 hours. So as we were gone that long and then while we were uh, back at base, I was the, um, for example, I was the electrician division officer in the maintenance uh, department and uh, worked with the, you know, uh, I had 20, probably 20 men under me all, all together and they were the electricians fixing things. Uh, also, no mo morale and laundry. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Also got to know uh, our um, uh, techs quite well, aviation uh, techs and uh, the different operators. And uh, the crews become very close. Officer and enlisted are really close. And uh, we got a chance to, uh, you know, doing constant training, constant training, briefings, here's what's going on around the world, and more specifically, here, here's what's going on here. So we, we spend a lot of time doing that, and of course, we'd come in at uh, 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning, we'd get breakfast, we had to have crew rest, things like that. Get some sleep. Get some sleep, yeah. And what were your living conditions, your quarters like? Let me put it like this. I knew I was in the right place because the Army and the Marine Corps came down to Cameron Bay for R&R. &R. So, <laughs> we, actually, we were quite, in a sense, plush. We had, we had what we call splinter barracks, which is all wooden barracks yeah. uh, with bunk beds in them and um, no air conditioning and uh, no, um, of course, we, had, we had ba actually had bathrooms where you could sit down and you know, and a, and a toilet, it was like, we actually had- A flush sink. toilet? Yeah, what is Whoa. this? Whoa. It was, it, was, it was pretty uptown. That's pretty uptown for Vietnam. That right, and we had one room, we had one air conditioner for the whole squadron. And they had brought it over from um, the Philippines, I believe. So you put it in the club. We put, we made one bedroom a club, that's right. <laughs> Build a bar, put the air conditioner in there, and we could. Uh, we were now I just guessed that. I knew I could hear that coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were the squadron that we could. Uh, we were large enough we could bring in drinks and bring in Coca Colas and. Chow was, was good. Yeah, Chow was decent. Actually, was decent. Um, the thing was worse. Navy about always the... eats better than everybody else. I hope so. I hope so. They. <laughs> <laughs> but the only thing about the chow, the the worst thing about the chow and the P2s, we did not have coffee making facilities and we flew all night. But we had a, a big container which we could plug into a plug and it would stay hot. And that coffee came and it was, um, it was brewed in the general mess in the morning at four o'clock as people were getting up. It was brewed then and it stayed all day till we left at night as we were going out at about oh. five in the afternoon. Take the enamel so, off your teeth. Uh, yes, <laughs> it really would. <laughs> and it, uh, I used to drink coffee, cream and sugar. Oh but my. it was worse with cream and sugar than it was with black. Oh so, yeah. That was brutal. <laughs> well, what were your impressions of the Vietnamese people if you had much contact with them? We, we had unusual contact, um, which was minimal because See, instead of going out and mingling with the folks, we, our Naval Air Facility was away from the main gate, so we didn't go out that way. We, we could, uh, if we needed to go to Saigon, we'd get on the, uh, they had a uh, C-1, uh, not, um, uh, what was a C-3. Um, anyway, we'd uh, jump down to Saigon and, uh, or somewhere if we wanted to see something. So we had very little contact with the people except the ones that worked um, on, on our, our naval facility. These were people like, they did lawn work, uh, they did laundry, they did... Uh, they Clean the, the hooches. Yeah, yeah, they did the barber, they worked in the, in the kitchen you know, facility. And, the, you know, and they were nice. They were very friendly. And uh, the only other thing we saw of them was one night we had a sapper attack. Um, and a sapper attack is well similar to what they have over, over in um, where we're currently having um, um, disturbances. Syria, Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. And these and these guys these guys would strap on backpacks and front packs, and fill them with uh, explosives, and they would uh, 
comes down, they'd go for uh, they'd go for typically equipment, you know, airplanes and personnel. Yeah. And uh, that, and and uh, they got, I think they sh on one attack they shot three of them, and they all were um, working on our facility. One was the uh, one was the barber. And one was <laughs> up there. One's We're always the, the barber. <laughs> so, so, and he's been shaving your right. neck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes you wonder. So that that's really the only that was very limited with the people, which I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to do. Yeah. Uh, describe your friendships with and your impressions of your uh, uh, fellow aviators, the people enlisted and officer that you yeah. spent your days and nights with. Okay. Um, God. I'm, as officers, we became really close um, because officers tend to hang around the thing they call the O Club in the evenings when there's you know, nothing else going on. And we got to get to know each other well. We got to know each other's families when we got back. And we were, I was actually there on three uh, deployments, three six-month deployments. So we got to know these guys and their, um, and their families, wives and kids and all. And uh, with the enlisted guys, we got really close to the ones on our, our airplane, which was like uh, seven uh, full time. Uh, from the um, plane captain, this is before flight engineer, but the plane captain, second mech, um, and then the different operators, radio operator, things like that. And uh, all good guys. Fun you had all kinds of spooky stuff on that plane. Y yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's out there, but yeah, they, they still use it, and it works very effectively. Yeah. One of the funniest things about one of the enlisted guys, he and I became good friends, and he was one of the operators, had his master's degree, long hair, didn't seem to care about anything. I said, what are you doing? Why don't you become an officer? He says, sir, I'm just serving my three years, and I'm getting out of this man's Navy. <laughs> Ran into him at a squadron party many years later. He was, um, I believe he made Navy captain in reserve. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I, you know, we had to laugh. We had to laugh because I, I was harassing him about it. And you know, anyway, uh, good guy. A lot of really good guys. It was a difficult time for some of the enlisted guys because there was a lot of stuff going on. Um, a lot back of, home. Well, back home there's some stuff going on. Over there there was things going on. With the, uh, there's a lot of uh, temptations with drugs out there. And um, most of our guys were, were pretty clean and against that. And, uh, but there was things out there. There was also a lot of racial things going on at that time. It was a thing of uh, the This is what power. year? Um, let's see, 60, I, yeah, 60, uh, 68 through 71. Yeah. And that was when the time of the black power and all. In the squadron, we were pretty calm. It was pretty calm. Guys did not harass each other. There wasn't a lot of bad blood. But uh, when they'd get out other places, it was, um, you know, it was interesting. A good place to stay away from. Yeah. So. What did you do for recreation, off-duty activities? Probably the most recreating we did was uh, something we called volleyball with combat rules. <laughs> everybody, everybody wore their steel-toed boots. Ooh. And uh, it was, there were basically no rules. Uh, it was limited rules, so. <laughs> it was cutthroat volleyball. And that it was, that it was. Uh, <laughs> and everybody loved it. It was, it was more challenging, and, uh, and we looked for different things. You know, Air Force guy told us la yesterday, I think they had so many casualties from their volleyball games, the commander ordered it ceased. Yep. <laughs> yes, I understand, I understand. Oh. Uh, do you have any specific memories of the popular culture at the time, music, books, film, etc.? God, yes. Um, music. Music. It was, you know, I was, uh, I was not into the pop music at the time, and it was the tie-dyed t-shirts and the, you know, Hate Ashbury, all that kind of stuff. And that wasn't my style of music. 
But now when you hear that, you go, I know where I heard that from. Yeah. That was back in those days. And, back in uh, those days. Yeah, and it was... Um, I got to get out of this place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It was uh, it was good music, and um, the movies, I'm trying to think, The Graduate was over there, and I think we got introduced to a guy named Clint Eastwood with us, <laughs> <laughs> and people could not believe some of the you know, great movies. Our uh, wives would tell us about them. Can you describe significant actions you witnessed or combat operations in which you and your squadron participated? Let me think. We had, uh, this is right before I got on there, a combat operation, the uh, deployment before, when they captured one of the um, high-speed junks. And that's back when we, on our airplane, we carried 50 cal. Uh, 50 caliber machine guns, and uh, stopped this um, stopped this high speed junk, captured it, and had the um, navy ships come in and get it, um, probably river boats or something like that. Anyway, um, other than that, we were generally not in the middle of of anything. The only thing that we got is um, occasionally the um, our um, our our boss upstairs would tell us when we were up north of the DMZ. Uh, they would say, so and so, uh, there's a, um, we've got something going on. Hit the deck, turn to 120, and go as fast as you can. And uh, keep your Get lights out. Get out of there. And we're launching the uh, mid cap, and uh, off they go. So just just keep moving. So, just get out of yeah, there. Yeah, somebody, you know, we'd been scrambled on, which happened yeah. every so often. Yeah. Because we're, we're, I mean, we're charging their coast. And they claimed 12 miles, we claimed that they had three miles. So. And so they would, um, they would scramble us. So. <laughs> uh, any difference in your second and third tours? Big difference. Big difference. Tell Very me what difference. that was. The major difference is uh, when we were <clears throat> back in the States, uh, we had to transfer or transition into a new airplane. This was a P3 or the Lockheed Electra. So that was four engine turboprops, air conditioning. Ooh, Ooh. it was something. Orion. Uh, yep, that's it. Yeah, we call it the Orion. Uh, airlines called it the Electra. And um, so, anyway, we, we did that. And it was really wonderful. That was. Uh, you had a longer range, you could stay up longer? Much longer. And we could shut down two engines when we went to, to loiter. And uh, so we could stay up 12, 12, 14 hours if we had to at altitude. Yeah. So that was, and that was good. Also a big deal, we were, um, we were our secondary base there from uh, Cameron Bay. As uh, my wife was back in Iwakuni, Japan, which was a Marine Corps air base. And at I in Iwakuni, uh, I had gotten back there like two days prior to that, and uh, I had the duty uh, one evening, and she was very pregnant, and uh, she, a neighbor took her to the, um, we were not allowed to live on base, since it was a Marine Corps Air Base, and uh, so we had lived in an apartment, so one of our neighbor ladies, good friend still, uh, took Pat to the, uh, went out and found a taxi, and <laughs> took her to the hospital. Took her to the hospital. <laughs> And uh, this hospital, they own post or off. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, she had the baby there, but I could not go in. When I when I got off duty, I couldn't go in with her because it was unnatural for a husband to be in there with his wife as having a baby. Yeah. So they had two or three 18 year old corpsmen in there instead. So that made it okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh. but uh, uh, that was the uh, biggest thing, and then the the big. Big transition from the going from the P twos when we were heading home, we used to we had the island hop instead of uh, the P three. We could go a long distance. Yeah. Um, with the P two as we were coming home, uh, we lost one of our airplanes, and it went down. Uh, the P two was supposed to um, be able to float for days, not a problem. This one went down. We were uh, alongside of it for a while, and they uh, one engine shut down. 
and they didn't have enough fuel to make it if they turned on the jets. So we left them behind and went on. We called the uh, Air Force to uh, Air Force Rescue, and uh, they came out, um, and we had then turned around and um, gone back and found them because we heard them. They said, "We're ditching, we're ditching, we're ditching." And I was in the left seat at the time. Our CEO was in the right seat. He was running the radios as I, as I was flying it. And um, he said, uh, did you hear that? Because our airplane back there said, we're ditching, we're ditching, we're ditching. And that was it. They were down at 50 feet. They used to do a drift down procedure for, um, for making range. They would, they would uh, turn on your jets and climb to about 2,000 feet turn them off, slowly go down on one engine. And you get down to 50 feet, stabilize, start the jets again. Well, what happened to them, they got down to 50 feet and they heard the other engine go cough and quit. Uh -oh. And they hit the water immediately. And uh, they already offloaded everything, all the, all their good shopping, all their stereo equipment. And all that they was out the door. Out. You know, new golf court, uh, new, new golf, uh, Set and everything like that. So, yeah, we did that. We um, did we, they did they float? Well, they got a, a fourteen man life raft, and we went back to look for them at a thousand feet, and we went right to where they were, and we didn't see them. We were very, we were we knew we had to be getting close, but it was just purely a, a wag, uh, a navigational wag, and uh, we came right over the top of them, and at a thousand feet, the only way we saw them is because they lit off their, their smokes and their flare gun. Yeah. Had were they not done that as they were going under the nose, we would not have seen them. They were that small. It looked like we went close, went around again. It looked like one man in a life vest. Wow. So one of our pilots at that point resigned. Uh, a couple others said, you know, no more, and you know, resigned his wings. Yeah. Resigned his wings. Uh, but uh, that, that changed You things. did recover the whole crew, though. Everybody got out. One man went down under. The, our tactical coordinator went under. He was pinned under the navigation table and the operations table. Uh, the radio man took off his life vest, went down after him, and got him up. Got he him was, up. Uh, he was ready, passed out. On the way up, his, uh, his worst injury was the, um, his helmet was swinging, going around his head at rapid speed as he was going up, and you know, just kind of scraped his neck up pretty bad. Yeah. But, uh, he saw his life go before his eyes, <coughs> scared him to death. And, uh, but he, he uh, was getting out of the Navy shortly after that. <laughs> so anyway, everybody got out fine. We had to, our crew had and to And that was your last experience of the P-2. Yeah, and that was, that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Do, what was your most vivid memory of your three tours in Vietnam? What stands out in your mind most? How it had changed, I think. Because I was there as things were changing drastically. When I got there, it was like, this is a real war. And we could see it. <coughs> talked to the Air Force guys. We talked to the uh, you know, different people around there. The, uh, Army guys who were coming out, they, they were 22nd Replacement Battalion right next to us there. As they were leaving, we'd, we'd talk to them and see how they're doing. And um, I had a brother-in-law who was there, and we tried to touch base with each other. We never could find each other. But, um, you know, we'd find out what's going on in the country with them. And uh, things have gone from a real war to a political war, I guess you'd say. When, you know, the... Um, Rules are being called from Washington, D.C., and uh, the things that are, you know, we can't do this, you can't, uh, you know, the rules of engagement were much different. So much so that my last deployment uh, there at Cameron Naval Air Facility, the, um, the CEO of the base, the Navy captain, his wife came and stayed with him for uh, four months. And <laughs> it was like, this is kind of unusual, we thought. But he, um, she started making some rules. She did not like the uh, young officers being in there in fatigues, but they should maybe wear a um, shirt and tie or a barong, which was the um, Filipino uh, dress shirt, formal shirt. So we had, to, we had to clean up our act and quit looking like um, 
Someone should have dropped a dime on her. <laughs> she yeah. wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, for sure. Anyway, yeah. it, it, it disrupted a lot. It, it, it killed morale. Yeah. It killed morale real bad. So I would think that so. That does happen. So just, another just, thing at that point, Joe, we were not allowed to carry guns on our airplanes. We could have our survival knives. This was where that came from, we're not sure. We think it was you know, from the base. But we could carry our survival knives, which were nothing like Rambo used, but uh, yeah. it was a knife. And um, if we wanted to, we could check out a, um, um, a rifle from the armory and carry those on the airplane with us. Other than that, no, no personal guns. pistol, no None. sidearm? None. They were not only frowned upon, they were, you know, said no. Outlawed. Outlawed. Guys still did it. They still took their, their, their piece and put them in the, um, you know, in the bag. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we, that's a sign of what it was like toward the, for us toward the end. Yeah. Describe for me the best day you had during your Vietnam tours. Wow. I guess I should say the last day there, but that, you know, that, that was no That was three except, of them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It was. Um, it, I, I had more fun meeting new people. I can't think of anyone standing out as far as um, any one day that was excellent. Uh, yeah, I can. My my first Christmas in Vietnam uh, made a big impression. We were sitting out there. We'd been gone. Oh wow, we'd been gone four months, five months, something like that. And they called us all out on Christmas morning. The CEO and XO called us out. The guys come out here and we sit on these uh, picnic tables. And um, what we did was said, we've got some things here for you guys. This is Christmas. So what we're going to do, we had uh, some, some people send some little things for you to, to have. And our wives and uh, families had sent things over for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, very difficult because um, they were over there. They had to send these things three months early. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, they would, uh, so they'd get there in time. So they, they got them over there, and I know I, some of the food I had was, well, it wasn't meant to be green, but it, you know, <laughs> it, it, it got green by the time it was there. But uh, pictures and memos, little gifts, meant a lot. Yeah. A lot of reading material. That was good. Yeah. That was probably the best time. My mother sent two pounds of pecan divinity. It came by ship mail. Oh, yes. <laughs> we yes. could have dropped it on Hanoi and <laughs> <laughs> yes. chemical warfare. There you go. There you go. Describe for me the worst day you had during your tours. Hmm. Worked a lot. I can't think of a worse day. I like to work, so <laughs> I, I cannot think. I honestly can't think of a, 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 a worse day. It was just days. Did Did you have much contact with our allies? By that I mean the Koreans, the Aussies, the Thais, the New Zealanders, mm. the Filipinos. A little bit. Uh, someone we went on R and R, we would run into each other. Uh, and the uh, the Koreans uh, were well known. They um, they were our real friends because they would uh, they'd be our outer perimeter. Uh, I mean it was the inner perimeter, but they kept everyone away. Yeah, yeah. They and everyone feared them. Yeah. They were they were good, but uh, we talked very little with them, and just because of what we did. Yeah. And uh, the Vietnamese allies, uh, do you have anything much to do with the Arvin? Um, we, we did, in flight training, when we were training some of their pilots, yeah. uh, had, had contact with them then. Over there, they had their own facilities, and we never got near them, which was, again, too bad. Yeah. We'd, we'd have liked to have done that, I think. Yeah. How much contact did you have with uh, your wife and uh, your family back home? I think the first deployment, 
I think I wrote her five times, and she wrote me more than that, and I'm, I think she still remembers that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I called probably, we had the Watts line, uh, we could sneak in at night and make a make Mars a call. line yeah. call. Yeah, and uh, I made a couple calls to her that way, and um, that was really neat. That was really something. To hear her, actually hear her voice. Did you write more the second tour? No, I took her with me. <laughs> you took her with you. <laughs> I took her with me to Japan, and she stayed in Japan while I was doing whatever, and, yeah. and brought a brought a baby uh, uh, that was born over there. So yeah, that was that was neat. Third That's deployment. I was by myself. How much news did you receive about the war from home, if any? We would. Um, you know, and, and guys would get together when uh, it was mail call, and we got our mail from the Philippines. It came into the squadron in the Philippines, and if we were over at Cameron, they'd bring us over, you know, every, every two or three days, whatever. Uh, and we'd get mail then. Um, Every, every so often the family would write, uh, my wife would write a good bit, which was um, very thoughtful. Um, we compared notes. We compared, um, hey, what did you find out? And, uh, you know, we knew each other's families back home and we could find out how the kids are doing, things like that. So that, that was really good. Probably the biggest thing we heard about was one event that happened, which was the um, our airplane, our P-2 that went down, all, all the people who were on that airplane, their hometown newspapers carried different stories by different news agencies. Um, and I think every one of them had something somewhat similar. And that was, they, you know, they flew this P-2V-7 or a P-2V and See, we didn't carry any bombs. We carried torpedoes and sauna buoys for submarines. Uh, we didn't, and uh, we didn't carry any, uh, 50 cals uh, anymore. Just while we're on certain uh, certain uh, functions, but uh, in all the papers, they all seemed to have another different version of the thing that said, "Fortunately, there were no nuclear weapons on board at the time of the crash." <laughs> well, we couldn't carry nuclear weapons if we had to. Yeah, exactly. But that was a, that was a a big thing for the for the media to put in there. So it was fun to compare. Yeah. <laughs> Were you aware of any particular political or social events or movements back in the states during that time? It's a pretty hard time back there. Yeah, it was. It was very difficult. We were um, we we would find out about it. Yes. We did encounter it when I went to transition. Pat and I went, both went down to transition to the P-3 in the San Francisco area, the Moffett Field and the Palo Alto. They got this uh, college there, it's called Berkeley, and there was a little bit of uprising there. Yeah. It, it got to the point that uh, we were told, don't wear your uniforms onto the base from your home or out when you're going home. Uh, your car windows would get smashed and things like that. And we did, um, so we didn't, we kept our uniforms on the base and then would drive on in civilian clothes and do that. And uh, we, you know, the, the base got overrun by students or demonstrators or whatever. So, you know, we did hear a lot of, uh, while well, back there in the uh, San Francisco area, you know, the, the, you know, the baby killer thing and the names and never got spit on. That's good. Um, but anyway, there was, we got to encounter some of that and we read about that. It was, Stars and Stripes keeps a lot of that stuff in front of us, so you can see it. <coughs> Describe your final return home from your last tour. Uh, <laughs> that was that was probably the most unique thing. I got to um, I was delivered up to Clark Air Base by the by one of our crews because uh, the, the the part of the squadron was back in in uh, the Philippines. So I got delivered by airplane up to Clark Air Base, and uh, it was me and uh, four enlisted guys, and who I knew them all quite well. So we got there, and uh, mine was getting close. I was within 10 minutes of, of check-in time. So Mike Widener said, hey, let me get your bag. You run in and make it. We'll see you inside. 
So one guy got the bag and, and uh, he got, and somebody else got another bag and I took off so I'd get there in time. So I was there about five minutes early. And um, I was there, I was, you know, getting up there in line. Yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay on time. And uh, the guy ahead of me took a little longer than unusual. The guy said, hang, hang on just a minute. And it got to me and uh, the guy didn't say anything. I said, I put this thing in front of him. He didn't look at it. He said, um, I said, here's my, here's my ticket information. Just a minute, be right with you. And um, most unique. Um, he said, finally, after about a minute or so wait, he said, okay, how can I help you, sir? And so I said, uh, well, here's my ticket. I'm checking in for the flight, which was like four hours, four, five hours ahead. He said, well, let me see that. No, sir, I don't see you on that flight. Really? In fact, you're late checking in, so we had to give your seat to an enlisted man, sir. And I go, ooh, <laughs> I know what's going on. <laughs> I said, uh, you know, come on. Can I make this or not? I, I was here ahead of time. You knew that. I said, sorry, sir, we gave it away. What do I do? Anything you want. See these people out there? A lot of these enlisted men have been sitting here for two weeks, sir. Should I get in line or what? Anything you want. So that was that. And uh, it was hard getting, you know, space available in there. So I figured, what's the best resource here? So I went in, uh, to an office, said, who's the senior enlisted man on the base? And I went and found him. He was over in RPS, uh, registered pubs, and uh, in the courier service. So I went and I met him. We talked for about 10 minutes and he said, you know, I'm sure you didn't come to ask where I'm from and all that kind of stuff. You got a problem? I said, yeah. I told him the problem. He said, um, how's your clearance? I said, I, got a, I have a top secret crypto. Okay, you be back here at whatever time this evening. You go find two enlisted guys who really want to be home badly. And you get them and we'll send you home tonight. So. We did that. I went over and found two guys who were desperate, you know. They were also young and uh, wanted to go home and see mom. And so they strapped guns on them and they strapped a briefcase on my arm and we went in the back of a C-141 and a, with a whole lot, I mean front to back, with um, pallets full of boxes of registered pubs, you know, um, information, codes, secrets, all secret stuff. And I had to sign for every box. <laughs> and we bounced from, from Clark Air Base to, um, what is it? we had made, uh, well, we made five stops, stopping in different, different bases. And uh, every, time we'd, every time we'd stop, the airplane would break. Huh. And I had to, I'd have to get, get out my, uh, list and cross some off and put new ones on and oh, I'll keep this for the rest of your life, you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so anyway, it went and uh, every time we'd stop, the crew would go in and um, the go, play sh would go break. shopping and see what the locals are doing tonight. And uh, when, they, when they were finished, we'd start back up. We did this and bounced across. So every place took at least a day and a half. So <laughs> it was, <laughs> Every time I'd stop and I'd say, would you please, to the, the, the RPS guy, the, the head of the you know, courier there, would you call my wife at this friend's n number? And the whole way across, so she should have had six calls. She got none. <laughs> none. <laughs> so I got to, we got to Hawaii and the guy said, sorry, you guys got to get off here and take Braniff back to uh, Travis Air Force Base. Whoa, that was good. So we did. I called her from there and I told her. So it took me about a week longer, and she had no idea where I was. The squadron had no idea where I was. You had no idea yeah. where you were. <laughs> exactly. But we made it. So. <clears throat> uh, how much contact have you had with uh, fellow veterans uh, over the years from your squadron? Quite a bit. 
officer enlisted, both of them. Um, we get together, well, we're going to get together this, uh, this fall, going up to, uh, we're meeting at Wright Pat Air Force Base, the whole squadron, you know, most of, of the ones still interested, get together, and we do this, you know, we go back and forth on emails and stuff like that, so keep up with each other. Got a lot of nice planes up there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, for sure, for sure. Uh, now, did you stay in the Navy? I got out. I went to one year in the reserves when I moved to Atlanta, because Pat and I went to Atlanta and um, found a house. I went, I went back in reserves for about a year, and they really didn't have anything to do. So um, after one year of just showing up at meetings and things, um, I dropped out, and I had one more year of inactive reserve. And so I just sat that out doing my yard work on Saturdays. Yeah. So. Any difficulty readjusting to life after the war? Good bit. Uh, probably one of the biggest difficulties was um, personal. Because I'd be over there, my wife would pay the bills, she'd do this, she ran everything. I'd come home and say, okay, move over. Here I am, back to take over everything. <laughs> and it was like, that was not my smoothest move. Uh, my smoothest no, line. no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so readjusting like that, how do we go from a young couple, newly married, uh, the longest we were together without a split up of at least a week or so, and sometimes six months. Uh, there weren't, weren't an awful lot of time, so we were just... We we're still kind of dating, you know? Yeah, know we figuring it out. And, yeah. And gee whiz, it took a while because uh, we were still like dating and all at once we're, well, here I am full time. How do we do this? And uh, <laughs> so it was a challenge. It was a real challenge. So, um, and, but adjusting to um, things I noticed. When I would interview, I was, I was hunting a job. Uh, when I would interview, um, businesses and looking for all kinds of things. There were no airlines hiring at the time or I would have flown with an airline right away. Uh, but there were no airlines hiring and so I would, um, I got my resume and this and that and got everything together and um, interviewing with these guys. I had my bachelor's degree and some of these guys had their bachelor's and master's, you know, an MBA and they and I'm going to, I'm fighting these guys and they're young, woo. But I was getting more offers than any of them simply because I was in the military. I had been in the military. I had worked with men. Uh, didn't have many women at the time. I don't think we had any in our squadron. Um, and gee, you were an officer, you flew airplanes. In people's mind, there may, be, may have been dissent over here but it stood out in people's mind that this is somebody who's been there. Um, they, were, they really felt good knowing somebody who'd been to Vietnam and actually done it. And uh, so the amazing thing is I had no trouble finding a job. It's just a matter of, you know. So I, so I, did, I did a job and, um, in sales, which I loved. However, it was difficult because I still have my military ways. I still call, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I still do that. Haven't changed. <laughs> so, and that's not something when you grew up in rural Ohio, if you said, yes, sir, that's kind of a surly way to answer somebody. And um, so you just didn't say, yes, sir, in the North. But I did. Do in the South. I was in the South at the time. Yeah. Uh. So my parents couldn't grasp that. But, uh, Is there any memory or experience from your time in Vietnam that stayed with you through the years and had a lasting influence on your life? Could you repeat that? That's a pretty deep thing for me. Is there any memory or experience from your time in Vietnam that has stayed with you through the years and had a lasting influence on your life? Yes. Um, 
and to say specifically what it was, I'm not really sure, but I, I and it, things keep popping up. You know, it's like, and, and different things, not necessarily dangerous in and of themselves, but you know what? I should have been killed back there. Why, you know, many, many times it's like, whew, somebody's got to be looking out after me because I'm not this good. And uh, <laughs> the odds are definitely against what's going on. Mm. And um, that hangs, still hangs in my mind the different things that have happened. And things have happened since then, things that happened before then, and uh, things I did in college or working in the summer times. And whew, I should not have been around. I should not have made it to my 25th year, I don't believe, but uh, I did. And that kind of that kind of hangs with me still. Did your experience in Vietnam affect the way you think about veterans coming home from combat today? Completely. Completely. Uh, <clears throat> the guys are, are um, it's good to see men are coming home after an honorable, honorable, and there's been some stories, uh, things that people have done. It's great to see them returning. I don't want to see them returning in the, um, the coffins, yeah. the body bags, it's not, it's not good. Um, but I'd like to see them come home. Anything, they need a lot done for them. Um, there's a lot I have met a lot of folks recently that were Vietnam vets that have, I guess what we, we never had back then, um, but they have it around today. They have this, um, this disease that, um, you know, I, I'm not thinking right, something's wrong. And um, PTSD. PTSD, yeah. yeah. And uh, talking with one fellow who's a, a he was a POW for five years in Hanoi Hilton. And um, he and I were talking and uh, we were, it was being presented to us about this, how PTSD was, we were working on a committee together and about how PTSD is gonna be the latest thing that we're gonna be able to help veterans with. And they described what it was gonna be doing and this guy goes, wait a minute, you know, somebody has problems with their with their children and they have several children and they got called up to active duty and they don't want to go because none of their husbands wants to take care of the kids. <laughs> it's like, and he goes, this is not, this is self-induced stress. This is, <laughs> and and, and uh, a lot of people don't like to talk about Vietnam. Um, maybe I was not involved enough, close enough to things that r happened down in the, in the foxholes, and I was not near any of that. Um, and I can see why some people don't want to talk about it, but I'm really surprised how many people probably have PTSD legally, but there wasn't such thing back, you know, back yeah. then. So. We yeah. didn't know about it. Didn't know about it, that's right. <clears throat> how do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today, or is it remembered? Unfortunately, there's not much. Well, when you look at the younger generation, people don't read history. Young people don't read history much. Um, it's sad. To, to a lot of young people, and I work with a lot of uh, younger people um, under the age of uh, 25 and um, if they're interested in military they know about Vietnam so many people does not did not know where it was <laughs> uh, they didn't know what World War two was they didn't know what World War one was Korea and uh, I that's that's a shame um, Vietnam people my age say to me golly you know I wish I could have gone. I was just a little bit too young. I was just a little bit too old. But I wish I could have gone. I felt like I missed something by not going 30, 40 years later. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, and they really, I think they really mean it. They wish they could have done something because they see something in people who did go. So uh, that, that's just an impression I see. 
Well, there, there are something like four million people on the last census listed themselves as having served in Vietnam when they didn't. Yeah. When and there's I, when there's only about a million of us left. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, four million served. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Don't know where they were when it was going on. A lot of people want to be there. Have been there. Yeah. I. Uh, there were plenty yeah. of vacancies. There are. <laughs> yeah. There are plenty. But, uh, In the end, what did that war mean to you and your generation, our generation? To me, it means there were a people being overrun. Uh, no freedoms. Communi communism was the big bad wolf at the time. And we have to get these people to be protected from being taken over by the communists. Um, and there were a lot of what we called chai coms at the time, Chinese communists. Um, we chased a lot of their ships and looked for their submarines. But um, the, um, well, I, Do me a favor, restate the question. I'd like to answer a little, a little more. In the end, what did that war mean to you and your generation? Um, and also it means we gave our best, as we knew. We, um, we tried. Sometimes we didn't know why we were doing things, even though we asked. Uh, being young and invincible, we asked a lot, what's this all about, why? Why should we do that? What's it, what's it going to accomplish? And we didn't always get answers, and our superiors didn't get answers. They just know to do it. Um, got frustrating when you see the things that um, Washington does, um, but I think we gave it our best. We um, have some of the finest young men. One thing I learned, I learned, I grew up. Something I hadn't done. I didn't have to in college, didn't have to in high school. There's a war going on, I better grow up. Time to, time to do something. And time to do something for somebody else besides myself. Because I'm, you know, like all, all people, we're selfish animals, we look out after ourselves. Well, you look out after yourself, but you give yourself up for somebody else, if they need, if need be. Have you been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C.? Yes. What are your impressions when you go there? Don't like it. Cry every time. Um, the, um, it's dynamic. I look up certain guys. Um, it's just hard. For four years, I wouldn't go. Yeah. Me too. So I've seen it, yes. I'm impressed with it. Very well done. Have you heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War Commemoration Project? Yes, sir, I have. What are your thoughts about that? Outstanding. About time, it was, um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, we had to wait 15 year, 50 years to... Uh, say thanks. To, yeah, say thanks. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I really appreciate hearing about it. Yeah. So, tremendous project. Um, can't say enough. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Joe. Thank you, sir. Good job. Great.